Thank you. Great. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Dorothy. It's a pleasure to be invited back to speak to my friends here at UAB New Horizons. It's been about six years that we have been doing a number of programs for you. Most of them feature different things that I've done over the last 37 years, working as a speaker on board cruise ships and as a tour guide and as a freelance writer. Now, as the speaker on board ships, most of my programs are destination focused, and we've done many of those at UAB, talking about places like Antarctica or the high Arctic or Scandinavia, the Panama Canal, Asia, wherever our ships might happen to be. A number of special interest programs we've done as well that feature uh, military themes with the Battle of the Bulge or we have Gallipoli, we've done the history of Veterans Day, things like that. This program today certainly falls under the special interest type of, of a heading. The Spanish flu of 1918 and looking at where we are today with the different safety and health protocols in place as a result of this COVID-19 coronavirus. What I'd like to do is take a look at what happened 100 years ago and how those people coped with it and compare it to what's happening today, especially the similarities, the same type of an H1N1 virus that has claimed so many thousands of lives across the United States and around the world already in six months. I want to look at what went on in 1918, how this virus may have originated, where it originated, how it so quickly spread to try to find some answers on how we're dealing with it today. Now, I'd like to, to begin by pointing out again that I am not a healthcare professional. When you're not an expert in something, you go to the experts who are. And this is one of the shows that I've really enjoyed putting together since I am landlocked now. As a matter of fact, for the first time in 37 years, I have spent the last six months at home. I'm usually eight, nine, or 10 months at sea. But this was a, an opportunity to go to the experts in the healthcare community to identify what happened 100 years ago and what is going on today. Let's start with looking at how the Spanish flu got its name. In Europe, most people called it the grip. Other places had different names for it. The Spanish lady, three-day fever, sometimes within 24 to 72 hours, a person who contracted the Spanish flu had died. So there are a number of different names for it. How did we come to call it the Spanish flu? Did it originate in Spain? Or was it in the United Kingdom, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, possibly Asia or the subcontinent of, of India, or in North America? Well, it's an interesting answer. And for that, we look at when it took place. 1918, during wartime, press is censored. Now, the United States did not enter World War I in 1914 when the Europeans began fighting. It would be 1917 before the United States entered the war. But by 1918, when the whole world was at war, there was press censorship, except, guess what, in Spain. So it was from Spain that we had most of the news of this pandemic. That's where it was being reported when it was censored in most places around the world. And what about this pandemic? What's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? I looked at the medical dictionary and it defines an epidemic as an outbreak of the disease that spreads rapidly and affects many individuals at the same time. What about pandemic? Is there a difference? What is the difference? Well, pandemic is an epidemic, but it's a greater range and coverage. The outbreak of a disease that occurs over a wide geographic area and affects an exceptionally high percentage of the population. That's exactly what they saw in 1918. This worldwide pandemic would claim as many as 50 million lives estimated worldwide. Now think of that and put it in perspective with the population of the world at the time. Today, there's about 7.2 billion of us on the planet. 100 years ago, there was about 1.6 billion. So think of the numbers when we have as many as 50 million who died in the Spanish flu. One of the most chilling things is look how quickly it happened. Within a space of about 15 months, those 50 million people had died. When we look at notable deaths, you'd be surprised to see some of the people who passed away at that time. You may not recognize this man's photograph. You recognize his name, probably. That's the grandfather of President Donald Trump. Frederick Trump died of the Spanish flu, as did the premier of South Africa, Louis Botha, a former first lady of the United States. That's the wife of Grover Cleveland, Rose Cleveland, 
And then the mother of William Randolph Hearst, Phoebe Hearst, passed away from the flu. You look at my own personal bit of history with it. This is my grandparents who immigrated from Greece about 1910. My grandfather, my grandmother on my father's side. My grandmother would be the one, Christine Sepsis, who died from the Spanish flu in 1918. And my grandfather who died after that would see that my father would grow up in an orphanage. But we didn't have a special connection with the Spanish flu. When you think of 1.2 billion people on the earth, you think of the three waves of this flu that went around the world infecting about a third of those 1.2 billion people. It's just astounding the numbers that we saw at that time. That comes to us from the American History Museum and a woman who is the chair of the Division of Medicine and Science. Some pretty interesting stats that they released. We looked at the people who did come down with that flu, but then recovered. It's a very young Franklin Delano Roosevelt. How about this man, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, who would see the, the King of Spain, Alfonso XIII, and then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, David Lloyd George, got it, but he recovered. Other people that you're familiar with, this is the man who led the Allied Expeditionary Force, the American Doughboys who went to Europe in 1918, John Joseph Pershing. You know this man, of course, what's your mom, Groucho Marx, right there, and Walt Disney. And then the man who would become the very first president of independent Turkey, Mustafa Kemal, a man known as Ataturk, recover from it. It's estimated that around 650,000, numbers run from as low as half a million to as high as 850,000 in the United States would die from the disease. We look at the major cities around the world, New York led the way about 6%, London, Paris, and Berlin following with the huge numbers that they would have die in the Spanish flu. Now, it's certainly not the very first time that the world would suffer under a pandemic. In the second century after Christ, what was known as the Anthony Plague, or the Plague of Gallen, would claim as many as five million lives. Again, those are estimates. There were no accurate numbers at the time. The Roman soldiers coming back from stationed in the Near East brought this with them, probably spread by rats at the time, cared by the fleas or the rats. So the smallpox was pretty much confined to Southern Europe. Not so 400 years later, with the Plague of Justinian. Justinian was the Roman emperor who was head of the eastern capital of the Roman Empire at the time. In 476 AD, the Roman Empire in the west, headed by Rome, would collapse. A hundred years later, they had a plague of Justinian that was brought back again by soldiers, but not confined to southern Europe. It was all over North Africa, Asia, and Arabia. Estimated that as many as 25 million people probably died in that pandemic. Look at the 800s and the 900s, not knowing the number that was given at the time of the people, but they were diseases born by insects and animals who spread dengue fever and measles. And then probably the world's greatest killer, we call the Black Death in the 14th century. In a period of just about 10 or 12 years, what was brought back by travelers traveling the Silk Road stretched from Venice across to China and the Indian subcontinent across the Hindu Kush, and then the water routes across the Indian Ocean, bringing it back to first Sicily and the rest of Italy, then all of Europe. As many as 25 million people, estimates as much as 40% of the population of Europe would die in the Black Death. We would see the same thing when the very first Europeans arrived in the New World. October the 12th of 1492, Christopher Columbus and his 85 crew members arrived in what is now the Bahamas. They brought with them a number of diseases against which the native people in this new world had no immunity, smallpox, measles, influenza. The Europeans had been living with them for years, but the native people had not been exposed to that. Look at the numbers. But at Christopher Columbus landing, 60 million indigenous people are estimated to have inhabited North, Central, and South America. In 100 years, those numbers were down to 6 million. We have one of the first colonies of England here on the Atlantic seaboard. The Massachusetts Bay Colony would have about a three-year period, of what they call the Massachusetts Plague, would claim tens of thousands of native people from that. And then, just a few years later, a fourth of the population of London would die in this great bubonic plague 
again, spread by rodents. We see some history-making events in the United States. 1781 is when Cornwallis surrendered. Decade later, we have the United States Constitution ratified, and it looked like Philadelphia was going to become the first capital of the independent United States. But this yellow fever brought back by people who were infected and by insects coming back from Haiti with the slave rebellion had taken place against the troops of Napoleon. A quarter by the time it was over of the city's population had died at the time. They decided they're not going to have a population in of the United States Capitol in Philadelphia and moved it to what was just a little swamp on the Potomac, Washington, D.C. We see the same thing with the riverboats plying the Mississippi River. 20,000 people are estimated to have died from yellow fever by the crews of these boats coming up and down the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers. We see the last of the great pandemics of the 19th century when what was called the Asian or the Russian pandemic. About one million people around the world died, and this would be very important to our discussion of the Spanish flu of 1918 and the pandemic today. Why is that? Is the people who had survived the pandemic that came along in 1880 had developed antibodies. Usually, I say usually because medical professionals say it's not always the case, but the people who survived this developed antibodies where they're immune to it, they usually do not come down with it a second time. We would see the 21st century with the severe acute respiratory syndrome and the Middle East respiratory syndrome. Look how those numbers have dropped considerably from the tens of thousands who had died previously. We've got the new age of medicine, 744 deaths in 2003 and about 400 of the 1,000 people who took it in the 2012 outbreak. Yeah, it didn't help in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. More than almost half of the people who contracted it would die of that. What we'd like to answer today is some questions of how did this Spanish flu of 1918 then begin? Where did it begin? Where was the pandemic? Was it in Europe? Was it in the Indian subcontinent or in Asia? Or was it in North America? And then probably the most critical question is how did it spread so quickly and so far around the world? First question, how did it originate? We looked at work that was recently published this summer by this man. This is a professor of epidemiology, Dr. Michael Warby at the University of Arizona. What he did was his group research and study blood samples of people and looking back at how that Spanish flu originated. It came from birds. He said the pathogen arose when an existing human H1 flu virus acquired genetic material from a bird flu virus that resulting H1N1 was able to avoid immune systems, which helps explain why it infected a quarter of the U.S. population at the time. That's the same H1N1 that has made its return today. If you're looking for some interesting reading, go to the National Academy of Sciences, where Dr. Ward's work was published in this magazine that for the last 100 years has been just the leading edge in peer-reviewed multidisciplinary scientific journal. Some fascinating articles, including the work that he did looking at the Spanish flu. So how about where it originated? Well, many medical historians feel like the first cases were from Asia. Why do they look at Asia? Look at what's happening in Asia at that time. Eight countries around the world, including the United States, were carving up China for trade purposes. Now, naturally, many of the local Chinese were very much opposed to that. And they called themselves the Boxers. They would rise up in what would be known as the Boxer Rebellion that began in 1899. It took about 1,100 captives to be held hostage. Many of them were Christian missionaries. Many of them were uh, political appointees there in China. It would take a lot of fighting for the next two years before they were finally freed and the Boxer Rebellion would end. By then, all of these soldiers are going home. And living in the close confines and quarters that soldiers always do, they would take the diseases that they had with them, including this flu that they picked up over there, back with them to the United States, the soldiers, sailors, and the United States Marines. And coming back from China then, arriving in the United States, it was very easy for that flu to jump across the Atlantic in the very popular transatlantic passenger ships that were flying the North Atlantic in those days. 
So there it probably spread throughout Europe, northern part of Europe and Scandinavia, in Africa and across Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Look at what Europe looked like at that time and see how easy it was for this flu to spread. There were five great empires of 1900. Of course, the British Empire. Look at the empire of the Hohenzollern family from Germany, the empire of Germany. And the Habsburg family, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, covered much of Central and Eastern Europe, all the way down into the Balkans. Then there was the Ottoman Empire. At one time, it stretched all the way to the gates of Vienna, pretty much confined out to what is today Turkey, parts of North Africa, and the Balkans. And then the largest of all was the Russian Empire, headed by the Romanov family. Well, this world at that time was moving towards war with the largest armies, the biggest ships, the biggest guns the battlefield had ever seen, and a lot of things that battlefields had never seen, aircraft, tanks. All it needed was a spark to set this war in motion, and a spark would be provided by this young man. A 20-year-old Serbian nationalist named Gavrilo Princip would conspire with five of his friends to assassinate this man, this is the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was vacationing in a little town in the Balkans called Sarajevo with his wife, Sophia. And on a Sunday morning in June of 1914, he would set the spark that ignited the powder keg. Pretty soon, all of Europe was at war. And the United States, as I mentioned earlier, would not enter that war until 1917. But the Europeans were fighting, and the Fighting quickly became trench warfare. Many times it was just a few yards that separated the Allies from the Central Powers. So these men were living in very close contact with each other. Sanitation, as you can imagine, was non-existence. Months at a time, these guys were living together. So what one man came down with, all of them would contract, including this flu. And we look at how it spread across Europe through the battlefields of Europe. There was Belgium, in France, there would be in Germany, there would be over in Russia, and then down in the Dardanelles at the Great Battle of Gallipoli. In addition to the soldiers who had contracted, many of the wounded and the men who were evacuated because they were sick were going home. So that means they were carrying the same influenza with them. So it would be spreading beyond borders where the fighting was taking place just in Europe. The President of the United States was elected in 1912 with Woodrow Wilson. Now, he was very much opposed to a European war, as were most Americans at the time. When he's up for re-election in 1916, his party platform was very simple. He has kept us out of war. But it came a series of events that would not allow the United States to remain neutral. One would be the Germany beginning this unrestricted submarine warfare. The United States was supplying the Allies, and Germany said, well, you're supplying our ally, uh, people we are at war against, so you're at war against us as well. Here's the, on the right, the Lusitania, great loss of life on that passenger ship. And then what really cinched it for the Americans was the interception of a note by the German ambassador to Mexico. His name was Zimmerman. They intercepted the note that the Germans sent to Mexico, promising them the return of the territory that they lost in the Mexican-American War of 1848, we will give you back California, Arizona, New Mexico territory if you side with us in this war in Europe against the United States. Well, that led President to go before Congress and Woodrow Wilson asked for a declaration of war, and he would get it in April of 1917. Now, Americans very quickly found how they were totally unprepared for a world war. Almost three million men would be drafted before it was over. They found that these guys, were, the very first day, you look at their recruits with the uniform, the guy on the left doesn't even have a uniform. At least they gave him a hat to wear. But very quickly, all of these men would come in close quarters, as we all did when we went in the military. You're getting your head shaved, you're going into training. Many historians feel that the origin of the flu in the United States was at this post, Fort Riley in Kansas. This is the home of the 1st Infantry Division. It's called the Big Red Wood the oldest division in the United States Army. Fort Riley was a frontier post in the middle of the 19th century, protecting settlers on what was then the frontier. It developed by the end of the 19th century into a large army post, and Camp Funston was a major part of that. It was one year after the United States entered the war when a private working in the kitchen, it's a mess sergeant, 
came down with what he called a bad cold or flu. The man was hospitalized, and then within just a couple of days, 100 of his colleagues had become ill. Within a week, 500 soldiers had been hospitalized with this unknown flu. It spread here, we would see it in Alabama in what was then called Camp Sheridan. This is down close to where Montgomery is today. Camp Sheridan would see, again, the very close confines of many of these men spreading this virus. Despite the valiant efforts of the medical healthcare professionals, they were combating it. Well, by the summer of 1918, Pershing is leading the Doughboys to Europe. As many as 10,000 men would be leaving the United States for service in Europe. How many of them brought this flu with them? We'll never know the exact numbers, but we do know that these guys were living in the same conditions that their other soldiers were living at the time. The very close quarters, the Allies, the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey. The virus then would spread like wildfire through the ranks of these men. We do know that about 70 million, think of those numbers, 70 million men were mobilized in World War I as a result of Gabriel Princip assassinating the Archduke. How many of those 70 million men that were mobilized would be infected with the flu? We won't know the numbers for the other powers, but we do know in the United States, it's estimated that a little over a third, about 36% of soldiers, and a higher number for sailors, about 40% of sailors. The United States Post, the Public Health Service would release those figures, and they said about 2.5% of case fatality rate, that's very, very high, very, very high. And look at how the victims were suffering. Sometimes within 24 to 72 hours, they were gone. It began with what would be a, a headache and fatigues. The coughing was so severe that many times the abdominal muscles of the victims were just torn, bleeding from the, the different mouth, the eyes, the ears. We would see 43 United States cities by the fall of 1918 reporting 200,000 deaths. Now that's about where we are today with the COVID-19 approaching the 200,000 numbers in the United States. Look how the figures would jump at the peak of the pandemic. There in October of 1918, we would see a spike that would be 10 times what it was in previous months. New York City kept some interesting records. Between September and November of 1918, they found that the prime age group susceptible to this virus were 25 to 44 year olds. They broke it down further with some chilling numbers. They found that single males were much more likely to contract it than single females. How about among married males and females? Where then it was the married female more likely than the married male. And then the most susceptible of all, and this was a real eye opener to a lot of people, widowed males. What is it about widowed males that make them come down with it more than anyone else? We would see that time frame again with the age group, 25 to 29, on the way up to 40 year olds, spiking at that time. Why the 25 to 44 year olds? Well, again, we look at the work of Dr. Warby. He decided to test blood samples from people in a little town in Alaska. 78 of the 82 people who lived in this little town were found to have found the flu virus prior to 1918. And what he did was to make the connection that people born during that time, that was the generation hardest hit by the Spanish flu, were exposed to that H3N8 that we talked about earlier. So they had antibodies for that particular one. But this was a different one. This was H1N1. And they had absolutely no antibodies to fight off the Spanish flu. Again, we thank Dr. Warby for his incredible work on that. Look at how we looked at it in Birmingham. 1918, we would see the very first case reported on September the 24th. It took less than two weeks for it to peak in Birmingham. 13 days is all it took for those numbers to come up to a mortality rate of about 0.6% right here. What they're so concerned about today was, will there be a repeat of the different waves of this Spanish flu? Look how it began in 1918. Numbers are scary, but they're not near what they were when it peaked in that second wave in 1918. Are we in for that? And then they had a third wave in the spring of 1919. We will be looking at that as well with the COVID. Again, these are questions that are unanswered today. 
what they compared it to was the same comparison that has been made today. In 1918, the most affluent, the lower middle class, and the very poor were looked at to see what their mortality rate, to see how much larger it is for the very poor, a full 1% as opposed to maybe a third for the most affluent, and the lower middle class, about half of that. Again, these numbers are from the Center for Disease Control today. It's kind of an eye-opening thing to see what life expectancy was at the time the Spanish flu began. Can you imagine men with a life expectancy of 48 years, women of 54? Okay, when the pandemic was at its peak, it dropped by 12 years for both groups. Life expectancy for men, 36 years. You can't even imagine that today. Determining the cause, there were no electron microscopes. They couldn't tell if it was a virus or if it was a bacterial infection. They didn't have what we have today. What was being done? Well, there was no way to look at it to identify it as a virus from electron microscopes. There were no vaccinations. There were no shots that you could take for it. And the very crude equipment they were using. These are the old ventilators that were used at the time. What they did find that they relied on was what we're looking at today masking and social distancing. They realized that coughing, spitting, close contact with people is gonna spread these germs. Didn't know what it was, but they said, do not spit on the floor of the sidewalk, walk to work. Do not use these common cups and towels. We're seeing the same thing today. They saw how deadly it was in the war. They said coughs and sneezes, and sneezes spread diseases, menacing the war production. Okay, they took it very seriously. Now here's a man and his wife and the four children about to go out on a Sunday, all of them wearing masks. And look at the cat he's holding. He's got a mask on a cat. Why do you put a mask on a cat? We would see people walking down the streets. We would see the cop on the beat to the sanitation worker on the street, all wearing masks. Not understanding where the, the virus came from or that even it was a virus, but it would be spread by human contact. The entire police force in Seattle, Washington, one of the very first to mask all of the officers. And then we hear a lot today about flattening the curve. What can we do to flatten this curve? See it start going down. Well, it's what they did in 1918, banning public gatherings. All of a sudden churches, schools, public gatherings were closed. All of the different entertainment being used and they would enforce isolation and quarantine from people who had the virus. Well, what was the result? Well, it would depend on how quickly the cities enacted some of these, implementing the duration of the safety and health measures that were put into place. And how quickly they did it was very easy to see. The cities that took longer, they waited to implement. They would look back at the death rate for 100,000 over a 24 week period. And look at there, Birmingham, number four, right behind Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, San Francisco. They were slow to implement. Look at how different the numbers were for the cities who implemented very quickly, sooner rather than later. Those numbers would be as much as one half as much as those who took their time in implementing. Again, the woman who is the head of the Center for History of Medicine at the University of Michigan will bring us those numbers. And we look at the Dow Jones average today. Look what it did in 1918, how it was battered the same way. Here is the peak in December of 1917 when everyone was really excited about how high the numbers were for the Dow Jones average. Look at that first wave, how they dropped. And then when the second wave came along, we would see December of 1918 drop into unprecedented numbers of the Dow Jones average. We're all talking about college football today. It's a passion here in the South, of course. How important was it in 1918? Well, this man, the president of the United States said it's very important. He said it would be difficult to overestimate the value of football experience as part of a soldier's training. It was a very different football game in those days. The uniforms that they wore, the, the leather helmet. Matter of fact, the man said your, your nose was your face mask. <laughs> the helmets that they wore in those days. 18 of the major colleges didn't even put teams out that year. Some would play a very shortened season and the season would begin as the Big Ten has just announced recently in October. Who is this team be fielded? And why are they important? Well, there was only a handful of players in those days, the guys played both ways. But it's the man here on the end. That's the legendary Newt Rockney. 
who was a coach of the Notre Dame team in 1918. He had his men pose with face masks. They didn't play with them, but they posed with them to show the importance of face masking. That even sitting in the stands, you're going to wear a mask. The great rivalry in Alabama is Auburn and Alabama. The University of Alabama did not field the team in 1918. It wasn't just because of the war. They didn't want to play any off-campus off games, and they wouldn't. Now, Auburn fielded a team that would play a shortened seven-game season. They probably wish they didn't. The two and five season, four of those losses were shut out. Auburn didn't score a point. Army versus Navy, classic rivalry between the cadets of West Point and midshipmen of Annapolis. 1918, they did not play. Wouldn't be because just of the war, but there was an Army football player who would die as a result of the scrum, the bottom of the pile he was under. They decided not to have the competition. They did compete in the tournament east-west game. What in the world is that? 1902 was the first year that what would be called the Rose Bowl would be played. They called it at the time the tournament east-west game. Today we know it as the granddaddy of all the bowls. It's the Rose Bowl. In those days, they didn't have enough college teams to play, so they had the Army playing the Marine Corps. Lady Liberty would present a flag to the Army and to the Ooh, Marine Corps. What's that? And it would be attendance of 25,000. Think of that. You get that much at a high school game today. They would see the Marines take it to the Army. 19 to 7 was the score. And then on a rail car in Compiègne, France, at 5.30 in the morning, the belligerents came together to sign the armistice. It was to go into effect at 11 o'clock that morning. So now 11 o'clock, the 11th day, 11th month, the guns fell silent, and all of a sudden, boys are coming home. They would leave a Europe, the cities had just been destroyed. The landscape had been rearranged to some of the fiercest bombing the world had ever seen. As these guys were celebrating, of course, no one celebrates the end of a war more than the guys who have to fight it. Well, they're starting to come home. They're leaving from the front. As they did, of course, they brought with them the diseases that they had contracted, including that flu. And then these guys, prisoners of war, close quarters, certainly, pretty dismal conditions they were in, they would come back to their home countries being repatriated with the diseases that they were bringing with them. There was great celebrations, of course, the war is over, London, Paris, here is Toronto. Then, the United States, no boys started returning to America. They're bringing those diseases back with them as well. One of the greatest outpourings of support for the World War I reunion would be in Philadelphia, one of the largest crowds assembled. And here are thousands of people coming into very close contact. As you can imagine, this is where the greatest spike in the flu came in that second turnaround. Philadelphia, almost twice as many people dying per population as in New York City, which is the epicenter today. We would see these age groups, 25 to 29 year olds, all the way up to the 44 year olds, who would be again, the prime group that's being infected. The world realized then that the pandemic is back, and this time it's more serious even than the first round. How much more serious? How about five times more deadly in the second wave than it was in the first wave? Five deaths per 1,000 people in the first time, 25 deaths per 1,000 in that second wave. Now the people are taking these more seriously. They're looking at all of the signs, all of the posters, all of the billboards that were up on the streetcars, on the street lamps. Spit spreads death. Do not spit. Wear a mask or you go to jail. That's how serious they were about preventing the spread of this much more deadly second wave. And it wasn't just in the United States. In Vancouver, in British Columbia, in Canada, we would see Sydney, New South Wales, in Australia. These signs in Paris show what people The one on the left in French says that the grip hasn't been beaten. The bars, the Germans were. The grip is not. On the right, mask yourself. Do not walk around without a mask. And then there were some very clever people who came up with some very clever ways to keep yourself safe. Eat more onions. Now, why in the world would you think of onions? And who would tell you to eat more onions? Well, it would be the people who are growing onions. They're selling their onions. We see this man, spraying. Well, it's not a bacterial infection. Spraying's not going to do any good at all. But they didn't know. They didn't know if it was a virus or a bacteria. You leave your windows open. Does the fresh air make a difference? I'm going to relieve you cough. What about take some heroin? Heroin? You kidding? Again, this is 100 years ago. Glycol heroin. 
the doctors were just overwhelmed with what was happening. One of them would talk about how overwhelming it was. He said the bodies would be stacked like cordwood. The problem that they had was finding enough caskets to get these people buried. The people who made the caskets had to post armed guards to prevent theft. That's how serious it became. In addition to the soldiers that they were bearing, all of the people dying from the flu. One of the most horrible things was to have to bury them in mass graves. The undertakers and morticians, unable to handle this demand, many times told the family, you're going to have to bury your own family members. Can you imagine that? One of the most tragic things was these people. These were called flu sitters. They went house to house for people who knew they were shut in or by themselves, and tragically, they found people who had died alone. Can't imagine anything worse than finding family members or friends or neighbors who had died by themselves, unable to get any help. Well, the economic impact was terrible in 1918. It was the same thing in 1919. There is how the Dow Jones was in 1918. We would see another crash with that second wave in 1919. World Series began in 1869. They were celebrating the 50th anniversary in 1919. Okay, would that be impacted? Well, it was a different game at the time. Instead of best of seven, they played best of nine. And in 1919, it would be overshadowed, the flu, by the great scandal. They call it the Black Sox, the Chicago White Sox that fixed the World Series. This man was shoeless Joe Jackson. He'd be one of two who conspired to throw the game. It's interesting that they were called the Black Sox by many people because the man who owned the team that said it was so cheap he wouldn't pay to have the uniforms cleaned each time. She would show, look at his uniform. That's not during the game, that's before the game even started. Today, we're seeing for the very first time since 1944 that this World Series will be played in the same city. Just announced that. The Stanley Cup, well, they didn't complete it. The Seattle Metropolitans were playing the Montreal Canadiens, but they wouldn't play because the Montreal team was in the hospital. Series not completed would be inscribed on the Stanley Cup. That forerunner of the Rose Bowl would be played, but this time it would be the Navy playing the Marine Corps. The same 25,000 people in the stands, this time they would see the Navy shut out the Marines. Finally, by 1919, in the springtime, we would see the influenza starts to fade away. What happened? What happened? A number of things. One, the people who had contracted it and survived had developed immunity. They're not going to get it again. And then the woman from University of Michigan said simply people ran out of people to infect. It's run its course. It's run its course. We were looked in and see the great change in the lifestyle and the life expectancy from 1917 to 1918, during the course of that flu, and even into 1919. And on down 12 years, we're knocked off the life expectancy for men and women. And then by 1930, they finally isolated that it is a virus. It's not a bacterial infection. 1957, we would see a new one, an H2N2. Each of these the new strains of the virus. 1965, the Public Health Service would recommend get a flu shot. And we started doing that. 68, we would see even a different way. The H3N2 virus would come. And then just about 11 years ago, we would see the return of the one that we have right now, H1N1. It was 1918, it was 2009. World Health Organization is an arm of the United Nations. It's headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. And in March of this year, they finally declared a worldwide pandemic. Look at the cases. Now, these are the numbers that the Johns Hopkins provides daily. And this is what picked up just the other day. This is just a few days ago. Around the world, almost 31 million people have been reported testing positive with the COVID-19. Now, close to uh, almost a million now have died. That's about 3.1% of the people who have contracted it. How about the United States? Well, we're at 6.7 million. That's about 22% of the worldwide total. And in the United States, we just now this morning went over the 200,000, again, reported by Johns Hopkins University. What about worldwide? Well, the United States leads this. 6.7 million cases, 200,000 deaths. Overtaking Brazil just the other day was India. Brazil is now down to number three. But look at the difference in the number of deaths in Brazil one and a half times as many 
as the ones in India, which has more people contracting. And then Russia, and they're very skeptical about the numbers of Russia because of their reporting system. Rounding out number five is down in South America, Colombia. We look at the United States, we look at by states, the top 10, well, there's California at number one, number two is Texas, number three, Florida, Number four, we see New York. This is important numbers here, a huge number of deaths. Georgia, down to 6,300. Coming up number six is Illinois. We've got Arizona. We've got New Jersey. We've got North Carolina. And rounding out number 10 is Tennessee. Now, interesting to note that this one, one is blinking. The state with the most number of cases is not the one with the most number of deaths. Twice as many have died in New York as opposed to the number of cases there in California. And where does Alabama rank in that? Well, just yesterday, numbers were released in Alabama of about 144,000 cases, 2,400 deaths. When you look at the numbers there in our state, and then bear down into Jefferson County with the leading numbers, about 18,900 of these as of just three days ago with 337 people having died. So many of these comparisons that are still being made today is to look at the at-risk age group. Okay, in 1918, it was 25 to 44-year-olds. What about today? Not so. Eight out of 10 are 65 years old and older. That's my age. I'm 73 years old. Many of us are in that age group. So you can see how seriously our age group is taking it. Again, numbers from the Center for Disease Control. Now, just as we saw a number of notable people and world leaders be infected in 1918, look at 2020. The president of Guatemala, Alejandro Gamati, will be infected. He's recovering, as is the president of Brazil, President Bolsonaro, the president of Honduras, Juan Hernandez, and the prime minister of Great Britain, Boris Johnson, all contracted. Some of the people that you may not be that familiar with, this is the prime minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan came down with the flu, as did the Prime Minister of Guinea-Bissau, and a man that you're seeing a lot of in the papers and the news headlines today is President Lukashenko in Belarus. And this man, Albert II of Monaco, came down with the flu. You see how the European Union would be the very first to see the greatest outbreak, but then the United States quickly overtook them, as whereas the EU has come dropping, the United States has been rising. What's going on? Well, they're worried about this twin dinner, a second wave. We would see beginning in June, a spike in the cases in nine different states around the country, leading with Texas number one, the Florida number two, California number three, four was Arkansas, and uh oh, number five, Alabama. Six and seven was North and South Carolina, eight was Utah, and number nine was in Alaska. The single record was on July the 2nd, in over 52,000 cases, and look how many of them were in Florida alone. Are we headed for a second round? July the 4th, if you went to Gulf Shores, you probably saw a lot of this. Social distancing would be enforced. Well, in places there, it was. Not, what about in California? Not much social distancing there, and certainly not in England. It is wall to wall. You couldn't even find space to sit down. This is in Bournemouth in the UK. They were having in July a record heat wave. The people then were not social distancing at all. Could it be what happened that caused this? Just a few days ago, Great Britain reported new 19, COVID-19 cases at their highest level since May in Northern and here in Central England. Now, what will that do? Will it force another lockdown? Well, they're looking at that today. Ban on inviting friends or family. Pubs closing at 10 o'clock. Matt Hancock is the health secretary of Great Britain. And just a couple of days ago, he said, we are at a tipping point. He said, if everybody follows the rules, we can avoid further national lockdown. I don't want to see it, but I don't rule it out. They're looking at it very seriously today in the morning news on banning household mixing, closing these pubs, and calling on police for people who refuse to self-isolate. What's the fine? They're looking at a 10,000 pounds. That's about 12,000 US dollars if you fail to self-isolate. That's pretty serious. Now, Europe was very serious about fines if you didn't wear a mask. In Berlin, in Germany, 50 euros. How about in Paris? This is what really takes the cake. 
135 euros for not masking. They were demonstrating across Europe against that. We thought it was just too outrageous. Well, we would see American department store chains start feeling the punch back in May and in June. Neiman Marcus, all of the great names there, J.C. Penney filing for bankruptcy protection, and Penney closing 242, they're not gonna reopen when, it, when the virus is lifted. How about the first quarter losses there for Macy's and Kohl's, almost half of what they've been reporting. Great stores like Nordstrom, 16 of their stores are gonna close permanently. And we see Lord and Taylor filing for chapter 11 just a couple of weeks ago. August the 2nd would be a major announcement by Taylor Brent. Who are they? They're the ones who own Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Bank. He said they are closing 500 stores. These are permanent closures. How is that going to impact? Other iconic, Gold's Gym, J. Crew, who would see Pier 1, stores closing. And GNC, which is in just about every shopping mall around the country, they're closing 1,200 of their stores. This pandemic is certainly taking an unprecedented toll among them. We just announced three days ago that Bed Bath & Beyond in the next few years are going to close 200 stores, 63 of them in this coming year, along with two right here in Birmingham. We would see Starbucks Coffee, one of the iconic coffee shops, every street corner and almost every airport around the world. They reported a $3.2 billion loss in the third quarter, closing 400 locations. What you're going to see, they say, are a lot more of these, drive through Starbucks. How about Wells Fargo? For the very first time since the Great Depression, they have recorded a quarterly loss. Very first time since the Great Recession. Hertz, one of the premier auto rental firms, 16,000 people laid off, Chapter 11 filing in May. This is just two months after the pandemic really kicked in. We see record number of people filing for unemployment. What was the rate? Well, it did at one time 14.7%. Look how it spiked over the previous year, down to 3.6, almost five times as high. Many people said that it's going to go even higher. They thought that it might go up to what it was even more than the Great Depression of 32%. Could it reach that? Luckily, it did not. It started going down in June, down to 13%. June, end of June, down to 11. By July, it was down to 10. And just yesterday, it was down to 8.4% nationwide. Now in Alabama, we're down to 5.6%. We've had a great turnaround in the number of unemployment. Again, Bureau of Labor Statistics providing those numbers for us. And what's the scary part is that it was two and a half times the job losses over what we had in the Great Recession. That 8.8 .8 million today, 22.7 million, two and a half times greater than the Great Recession. These are unprecedented times for sure for us. One of the greatest of the automakers, almost 15,000 of their jobs lost in Renault. We see the largest one in the United Kingdom. They have applied for help under what they call the Emergency Coronavirus Lending Program, looking for a billion pounds. That's about a billion and a quarter US dollars. And they're looking for more. Tax credit, grants, other subsidies totaling about two billion pounds. Well, they won't stay afloat. Air travel, this is something that has impacted me looking on cruise ships as I was. If you were traveling around March or April, these are the scenes that you saw. In April, down 94% for international travel. That's just unheard of numbers. We would see July, those numbers start improving a little bit, but they're still three quarters of what they were. Airports virtually empty. We talk about the $84 billion that they're expected to lose across the industry this year alone. 12,000 jobs at risk, they've upped those numbers already. This is IATA, International Air Transport Authority. Worst year in the history of the industry. I was traveling after 9-11, and we saw planes that were near empty for about the next two or three weeks. The travel came back. Will it come back here? And when will it come back? I hope you've flown 747, the ship made by Boeing, is called the Queen of the Skies. If you haven't, it's very likely that you will never fly one. Why? The largest number of those are in the British Airway fleet. They have 31 of those, and they just announced two weeks ago this great sadness that would confirm we are proposing to retire our entire 747 fleet, effective immediately. If you've been to Australia or to New Zealand, you've probably flown Qantas. 
That's Queensland and Northern Territories Air Service. That's the national airline of Australia. Most of their flights, so they're 14, 15 hours from the U.S., are on the 747s. Not anymore. They retired their entire fleet of six. How about Delta Airlines? This is a fleet at Birmingham Airport. They had them stacked on the runway. Six billion dollar losses in the second quarter alone. In June, they were losing 27 million dollars a day. And then they made the very heartbreaking announcement, 128 aircraft are going to be retired. The ones that are oldest, that can't bring them back up to paying very quickly, are gone. United, another one of the premier American flag carriers, 13,000 executive positions, gone. It's not just the rank and file guys at the bottom. These are executive positions. If you have traveled in Europe to some of these, are the sites that you saw in Milan or in, in St. Mark's Square, or if you were in Asia, face masking for the beautiful dancers in Bangkok. Well, cruising would pretty much be shut down. I was among the 100,000 who were pretty much shut out of the industry when in March, everything closed. Figure on the left is Miami. On the right is over 30 cruise ships are being anchored in Manila Play. They're not moving, they're not going anywhere. Miami Herald said at one time, 100,000 crew and staff were waiting to be repatriated. Sadly, about six people have committed suicide from the over a thousand that are still on board some of these ships. It's a sad, sad day for the industry, losing upward now, at looking at about 100 billion. The Carnival Corporation has had some interesting things come up. They are one of the largest in the world. They own nine different cruise brands under the Carnival banner. They've got about 120 ships. Their president and CEO just announced the other day they're selling 18 of their ships of 12% of their fleet capacity. Sometimes it costs more to start up a ship that's in what they call cold lockdown than to bring it back into service. The president of another of the major cruise lines, Norwegian Caribbean, Frank Del Rio, said enough is enough that we close to devastation. We've got to get back to work. They presented on Monday, along with Carnival and some of the others, to the Center for Disease Control, their new standards for what they're going to do now. How are you going to get back to work? This is what we propose to do. They tried it in Norway. The Royal Amundsen is one of the expedition ships that we're on. It makes a run along the coast of Norway, all the way up to Svalbard in the Arctic. They ran two seven-day cruises, but they shut down COVID cases again. So they're not operating. What has begun in the Mediterranean is one cruise line. This is Costa Cruises. This is one of the Carnival family. And they have begun operating seven-day cruises in the Mediterranean, but only to Italian nationals. They hope by the end of the month, they will open up to all nationalities. A lot of precautions they're taking, they are operating in the Med, one of the few that's moving. The entire travel industry, the riverboats, the cruise ships, the airplanes, the hotels, the attractions, the restaurants, they're looking at a 2.7 trillion, think of that, a trillion loss in the travel industry. Again, unprecedented. Hotels, right? take your pick here in the lobby. Looking at restaurants that were shuttered, some of them opening on a limited basis now. Looking at one of the iconic restaurants in New York that survived two world wars and a depression. They're not open anymore. They're closing and they will not reopen. And then what was just reported this morning, the New York Metropolitan Opera, the landmarks in New York City, they are now closed until the fall of 2021. So this has had an impact on the economy unlike anything we've ever seen the largest quarterly decline since they began keeping records 70 years ago. Largest quarterly drop here that we've seen. Gross domestic product annual rate of 32.9%. Last time we saw that was 100 years ago. Again, these are numbers by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We see the impact on shopping malls. Well, before they had already been impacted before the coronavirus, with people shopping online, e-commerce, Many of them, Moody's analytics report, we've seen accelerating at a rapid pace. How rapid is that pace? Well, higher than they've ever seen before. 9.8% of vacancies in malls. Some of them are doing this, they're turning into schools and offices. So we're seeing the landscape change there as well. It would be none other than Amazon who is looking at the mini closings of JCPenney and the Sears store and making them over into distribution centers. People have to get creative to survive in this COVID environment. 
The gross domestic product in Europe, this is the largest quarterly drop in the history. These are the 28 countries that are Euro countries and the number that are using the, in the Eurozone are the ones that use the Euro. These, the Eurostat reports these numbers. Unprecedented drop in the gross domestic product. We see the United States as well. And many of our stocks and investments have plummeted at this time. Well, in February, right at the time this was just coming to play, we saw the worst single day drop in the history of the Dow. Now almost 1,200 points. If that didn't scare you enough, look what happened just a couple months later. It dropped again an unprecedented number, down almost 1,900 points. Luckily, it has risen today. But we still see this. We see vacant houses of worship. We see a lot of streamlining, video worship, limited opening, people social distancing. We see working from home as being a popular thing. Well, that takes a lot of ingenuity. Man sent me this. Well, this could be the place of working from home. What do I do with the kids? Well. That's his solution. And then a friend of mine who's a minister sent me this. He said, what about baptisms during this time? We'll be using the squirt guns to get to baptize the baby. Well, hopefully they're not gonna come to that. Virtual birthday celebrations, drive-by birthday celebrations. So you can see 1919 to 100 years later to 2020, huge advances in medical science and technology and it transformed our world from what the people in those days we're experiencing still the danger that it presents today. Even with our technology, our medical advances, we have identified it as a virus. This is a photograph from electron microscope. Why well, call it the coronavirus? Well, corona is the Spanish word for crown. I'm looking at it under a microscope, it's a crown-like array of spiky outer proteins. And we're certainly appreciative of the Herculean efforts of our healthcare professionals today who are combating this keeping us safe. And look how it's changed the face of medicine right here in Birmingham. This is 1960s in UAB. When I graduated in 68, that was what it looked like. Look at it today. We've got 14 hospitals and 12 ambulatory surgical centers right here in Jefferson County. We see the hundreds of doctors' offices and thousands of people. UAB is now the largest single employer in the state of Alabama. Prior to the COVID pandemic, we were hearing about this, telemedicine. Well, before the pandemic, we were getting about seven of these visits per day at UAB. Look what they're doing now. With the fear of the coronavirus, 2,100 per day. It's the way to the future. The way to the future is the manufacture of the items we need. Gloves, face masks. What about face masking? New York Times interviewed 511 epidemiologists. How long are we going to wear masks? The majority of them said we're probably wearing them for at least another year. And then he said we still won't be comfortable attending public events. The worst casualty of the pandemic is the loss of human contact. But certainly that's true. We want to shake hands with people. We want to hug people. We're told not to do that. Here's a man that you see a lot of on television, newscasts, Dr. Anthony Fauci, National Laboratory of the Union Immune and infectious diseases. He said, likely we can begin normalizing socializing by the end of the year if effective vaccine is available. And that's a big if. That's a big if. He said the coronavirus is likely to end by the end of 2021, like we saw it 100 years ago, it started phasing out. But again, that's if this effective vaccine is available. Just the other day, three of the major producers, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and Pfizer, so they are now in stage three of clinical trials. When will a vaccine become available? Will it be by the end of the year? Will it be by next year? We don't know. The Trump administration, in what they call Operation Warp Speed, is funding this, and hopefully they're looking for something sooner rather than later. How about going back to school? We've seen a lot of that. Much of it online educate, distance learning. When they looked around the United States, at the top 25 largest school districts, 19 of them started back online. Some of them were partially online, some would be very totally online service. Were they returning too soon? Well, here's a study that came out from four different universities. The college and university that reopened for face-to-face -face instruction might have caused tens of thousands of additional cases of COVID-19 in recent weeks. On the other hand, by the way, those numbers that, that they're saying, 
Those are the younger people that are there. They'll get it, they recover from it. The problem they're saying is that they're spreading to people of our age to the most vulnerable. On the other hand, there's a report that came out just this morning from Brown University. That's Brown University, one of the Ivy League schools. They surveyed 550 schools in 46 states over a two week period beginning the end of August. And their report was released this morning. They said only 0.076 confirmed positive cases and 0.15 of teachers tested positive. So that doesn't seem like it's a huge number. Those numbers were released just this morning. So it's both sides pushing for the opening and others for pushing for distance learning only. How about NCAA football? What's going to happen this year? Well, very first, the Ivy League school said they're not playing. Middle American concert, not playing. We would see UAB, they play two games. They're in Conference USA. Power Five, these are four of the Power Five conferences, the Atlantic Coast Conference. We would see the Big Ten, which just announced the other day they are playing. We just, the announcement of the Big 12, they are playing. The only one of the Power Five that's not playing is the Pac-12 on the Pacific Coast. They are not playing this year. SEC begins this coming weekend. They're playing conference games only, a 10 conference game schedule, and it begins on Saturday. Now, will they be closing down? They're worried that the Missouri team, that has so many people on the team already, have opted not to play because of the virus, and another number have already tested positive. If they don't have enough, that game is subject to cancellation. We'll see what happens today. Major League Baseball, well, this is all preseason. There would be no minor league baseball. There would be no preseason games. They did start in Jan July the 23rd on a Thursday in unprecedented times. Again, empty stadiums. Some of the players wearing masks, some not wearing masks. They tried piping in crowd noise. They tried cutouts in the stand. Nothing works. It's just not the same. And many people, is it too soon? You look what happened right after the start of the three-game series, Miami Marlins and the Philadelphia Phillies. 18 of the staff tested positive, and they would have to reschedule the games coming up after that. You see the same thing a week later. Milwaukee Brewers playing the St. Louis Cardinals, they would have six of their players and staff tested positive. Within just a week, 12 postponements affecting eight teams would lead this man. This is Rob Mantry, the commissioner of Major League Baseball. He said, we may look at canceling the remainder of the season if we don't get the flattening of the curve on all these players. we are having too many people testing positive. Well, how about basketball? NBA is playing for the playoffs. And the NFL began just a couple of weeks ago. They're playing. This is one of the most respected molecular biologists in the world. He passed away just a few years ago, but Joshua Lederberg was the leading man in his field. He received every award you can receive, including the Nobel Prize in 1958, and President George H.W. Bush awarded him the National Medal of Science. This is the man who left us with a chilling and very sobering thought. He said it's not nuclear annihilation that we need to worry about. He said, the single biggest threat to man's continued dominance on this planet is the virus. Think about it. He said, how easily it spread. He said, we have massive urbanization. We have very close proximity of humans to animals. And that's where many of these diseases originate. Our global economy, the ease of traveling internationally, and the movement of refugees that we're seeing from the Middle East, from North Africa, moving across Europe, moving into North America. This was an interesting article that came out in the Smithsonian Magazine of just August of this year. You want to look that up, and it's called the Virus Hunters. And they showed some chilling thoughts as well. Almost two-thirds of human diseases originate in animals. They're called zoonotic pathogens. Now, that's even more chilling when you look at how many of these viruses there are. More than 827,000 in the animal world have the potential to affect humans. Now, H1N1, COVID that we have today is just one. Think of 827,000 of them out there. He said, it's a perfect storm. They're out there waiting to emerge. You might have read a lot of this man's prophecy. Michael Nostradamus, middle of the 16th century. He left us with it. There will be a twin year. Could it be he's talking about 2020? From which will arise a queen. Well, the corona, the queen, will come from the east, well, up in Wuhan in China who will spread a plague, could it be this coronavirus, in the darkness of the night on a country with seven hills. 
We're looking at Italy, a city founded on seven hills of Rome, the first outbreak of them, transform the twilight of men into dust or death, to destroy and ruin the world. It will be the end of the world economy as you know it. Certainly, he's on track for that. It certainly has changed our economy. Well, we see what they're talking about in this last month's issue of National Geographic. This is some chilling thoughts as well. He said, we're spending $18 billion on an aircraft carrier. Will we be spending the same amount of money and even more to prevent epidemic diseases? We see the very real threat militarily in different places around the world. So if we provide for that with our military, with an $18 billion carrier, will we do the same amount of money for, to prevent these pandemics? And he said, we can't just forget about them when they're over. He said, we've entered a frightening new world or maybe returning to the old world of our disease-plagued ancestors. And one great lesson we should take away from history is this. When the current pandemic ultimately subsides, we cannot afford to forget that it happened. We cannot just move on. And that's what happened in each of those pandemics that we talked about. It's over, let's forget about it and move on. But we can't do that. You can't do that. It's out there. He said, somewhere on the planet, the next great pandemic, the next great destroying angel is already taking wing. Is it out there? Are we going to have a second and a third wave of this one? We don't know. Leaves us some very chilling thoughts there, and, and hopefully we'll be seeing in the next few weeks some good news come along with the testing of the vaccines and the flattening of the curve. But I hope you enjoyed that look at the history of this coronavirus that we have today, what happened 100 years ago, what was done at that time, and what's being done today in some of the comparisons. Now, uh, Philip, if you'd like to unmask, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer some questions there if anyone has. And mute everyone or just one by one. All right. Thank you very much, Nikki. Yes, uh, if you would be uh, willing to take some questions. I'm sure that there will be people here. You can unmute your microphone. You should be able to unmute and ask uh, Nikki a question. Um, uh, Nikki Sepsis? Yes. This is Ron Vinnick. Yes. Thank you for the most comprehensive talk I have been to hundreds and thousands of lectures, uh -huh. and I don't think I know of anyone that tackled the problem as in depth and with such interest as you have. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, the bottom of my heart. You made my day. I hope that, uh, that you have enjoyed it. I have a question, though. Yes, Is there an explanation for the origination of these flu viruses from the east to the west? That uh, the, the Middle Eastern virus? The no, no, just in general terms, the flu viruses and the other viruses seem to originate in the Far East, maybe China or elsewhere, and they come to the West and to the, and to the Southern Hemisphere. Is there an explanation for that movement? What I have seen in some of the researching here is that the close contact that the largest nation in the world number of people, the billion of people that live in China, and these open air markets that they have, where many times live animals are sold. And they point to that as a very potential, a high potential risk for that spread. Uh, when they jump, people are, are, are buying some of these animals for meat. Some of them are, are used as aphrodisiacs. They'll use some ground up powder of a lion, whatever they're using. Uh, many times, with the ease of international travel that we saw before March of this year, this is spreading not just from where it, like this one is supposed to come from a market there in Wuhan in China, very easily spread to the west and then into the northern and southern hemispheres where we are in North and South America. That's the, the work, the research that I have seen points to that. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, this is Larry Roddick. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to tell a little vignette uh, from my past, from my daddy. My daddy was 18 years old in 1918 when he entered World War I. And he told me a story about going across the Atlantic in a, in a troop ship in which most of the soldiers got the flu. And many of them died before they even got to Europe. Wow. And uh, 
Somewhere I've heard that maybe as much as half of all the deaths in World War I were caused by the flu. I've seen those numbers as well, uh, Larry, that you mentioned, yes, that, that so many men, uh, not just flu, but other diseases that they contracted from the close contact and the, the lack of sanitation that they lived for months at a time in the trenches. They would evacuate from Gallipoli more, more men than, than would die in, in, in the combat there. And I'm sure that was the same place in the, in the trenches of Western Europe as well, those numbers that you mentioned, the, the disease that were just rampant. Uh, one picture that I had was of a troop ship with uh, bunks stacked five men high. Now you're right on top of each other at that. So you can imagine if one guy gets it, everybody's gonna get it. And I'm sure those numbers that you mentioned that, that, of dying before they even got there, that's such a chilling, sobering thought. Uh, are are there other questions? It, it, I have I have one question. It, it seems to me when you look back historically, weren't a lot of the plagues really more? Uh, uh, they they were bacterial type infections, whereas the, uh, the the problems we have today are more viruses. Is that correct? That's correct, from what I understand as well. You look at some of these that spread from the Roman Empire, those were, those were bacterial infections. And then going across, when they're, they're spread by rats, with the fleas that infect the rats, uh, you have something like that. Now that they've been able to identify viruses, they can pinpoint the H1N1, the H3N8, the H2N2, these different viruses. And, and those are totally different from, like you mentioned, the bacterial infections that we saw in so many of these others. Okay, uh, do we have any further questions for Nikki? Well, let me just mention that uh, I have asked Nikki if he would uh, come back and talk to us again in January and talk to us a little bit more about what he has done over the years working on cruise ships and his job as uh, been someone who has given these many, many talks that he's given. And I wanna ask you, Nikki, uh, do you predict when you will ever be on another cruise ship? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I haven't been landlocked for six consecutive months since 1983, uh, but I have this time. And the, the disconcerting thing uh, for so many is that we don't know when and if it will come back. I certainly feel it will never be, cruising will never be what it was. Uh, at one time. The grand buffets that were offered on many cruise lines where eating is a featured activity. Uh, those grand buffets now are, when they do start back up, they're gonna have staff members, you know, uh, dishing out and, and, and presenting to you the different things on your plate uh, if you're going through a buffet line. It won't be what we knew. As far as the timing, the Center for Disease Control has closed the United States to ports through the end of September. They're trying, the cruise lines and the airlines are working with the CDC, uh, giving them the guidelines now that they have and the protocols that they're putting in place if they can start up in October. The problem is some of the cruise lines that want to offer Caribbean cruising, which is very popular in the fall and winter months, but if there's no U.S. ports open, they'll have to operate out of Nassau in the Bahamas or Bridgetown in Barbados. So if it starts back, at what point it will start back and at what the industry will look like. Many of the cruise ships that you're familiar with are heading for India to be burned down into scrap. Uh, others are in cold and warm lockdown. The ones that are in warm lockdown will be starting up hopefully by the first of the year. I'm scheduled to go back out later on next year, but will they have someone like me on? Uh, when they have president of Seaborne Cruise Line and the president of Holland America Cruise Line, positions have been done away with, I can imagine that the speaker of Nikki Sepsis uh, might not be the, the person who's going to be on board if they're doing away with presidents. So I don't know, I may be permanently furloughed and doing these talks that I do around town, schools, churches, libraries, and going out from time to time on land tours, taking groups. So in answer to your question, I wish I had a date and a lot of thousands of other people uh, wish they had a date as well. Well, once again, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today.
Uh, I might mention that next Wednesday, we will have John Mannion, who is the curator of native plants at the Botanical Gardens. And I hope you can all join us for that, that session next Wednesday. And uh, for everybody else, stay healthy and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Philip. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks, Dorothy. <laughs>